Good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dennison, what nutrients do we need to ingest most on race day and training runs to maintain our stamina? Um, I think the most important nutrient is going to be carbohydrates. So before your long run, especially, and before the race, carbohydrates, your easy digest carbohydrates, such as like your graham crackers, bread, bagels, oatmeal, um, yogurt, things like that, that's going to be super, super important. Your body uses carbohydrates as the main source of energy while you're running. Um, so it'll store it in your body's glycogen, in your liver, and in your muscles. But that's that's the main source that your body's going to use during your run. Um, it is really important to try different breakfasts that you and find things that work for you, like during your long run. So um, my favorite breakfast is usually like a bagel with peanut butter, maybe some jelly on it. And then I'll obviously drink some water, maybe some sports drink. And then if you're running for more than 60 to 90 minutes, bringing some carbohydrates with you, whether that's like a gel, a gummy, sports drinks, finding what works for you. Everyone's different. I cannot drink sports drinks while I'm running, and I know that. And the way I learned it was during a race, <laughs> which is not the right way to do it, but that's how I learned that. Um, but different gels can work, and then bringing water with you, bringing things like that on your long runs, those are really your practice runs for your races, whether it's a half marathon or, or full marathon. You have enough, enough long runs on your schedule, hopefully, that you can practice that. So uh, carbohydrates are definitely the most important, along with hydration will go with that. Um, I think something, another one to think about, depending on who you are as a person, if you sweat a lot, um, sodium is also something to, to think about as well. So if you're running, it's hot, it's humid, you notice you have like white crystals on your skin that may indicate that you are a heavy sweater and that you need additional sodium in your diet, which you can take before and also like on your run, like those, those sports drinks will include sodium and some of those gels and things like that. So those would probably be my top three for, for the average runner. I love that. I, I crave uh, salty chips and a banana after long runs yeah. and like a big thing of sports drink or water. It's yeah. just, it just can't, like I don't eat that normally, but after <laughs> a long run, I'm like, give me all the potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you usually, your body usually knows if you're craving yeah. something, then that is, yeah, yeah. you probably are yeah. salty sweater, which Absolutely. is totally normal, totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> Dr. Toll, what advice would you give to women and girls 18 and under about how to compete through their menstrual cycle and any nutritional advice during that time as well? So I would say again, kind of we circled back to this, yes. l listen to their body, understand um, 18 and below can be a hard time because um, for your menstrual cycle particularly, just in that it is still kind of growing and it's still developing as well so it's not uncommon for women under 18 to have irregular periods heavier bleeding or more painful periods um, many of us may have experienced that um, so but that can change your menstrual cycle can change as you grow um, so if you're experiencing that again that's also something where depending on the effect it's having on you maybe talking to someone you trust or a woman's health provider even at that age can be really important it does not have to include a pelvic exam it can just be talking about symptoms symptoms. And so I think that that's something that I think the pelvic exam is kind of a wall that kind of keeps, keeps people from wanting to talk to a women's health provider. They think they're going to have to have that done. Absolutely not. If we're just kind of talking about how your period is affecting you, there can be ways to kind of assess that, treat that, support that without needing that. Um, so I would again say listening to their body, movement can be really powerful for making those symptoms of a period during that time better. And so if they feel up for it and they're not feeling pressure and they are exercising or moving in a way that is feeling okay to them and it's helping, that they should continue that and support knowing that they're not going to be... Um, injuring anything from the perspective of their menstrual cycle. I think it's also a time where you can be more vulnerable to pressures of how they want their body to look or how they think they're supposed to be doing or how um, there's just a lot more external pressure. So also understanding that movement is for them. It's not for a way they look. It's not for um, how their cycle is supposed to go because we do know that women in this age can kind of get into a cycle of over exercising under nutrition and then that can lead to problems down the line so I wouldn't want them to have any pressure that's pushing them too far one way or the other um, and then in terms of nutrition during that time they need to have adequate nutrition is probably my my number one thing um, but if the time around your menstrual cycle or your period is really painful problematic or you notice that certain foods make things worse. There are, you know, higher refined sugars, less kind of whole foods, less plant-based can make some of these menstrual symptoms worse. So when in doubt, kind of going back more to whole foods, more plant-based, um, less 
additives is usually going to be the better play um, to just try and keep your body as healthy, um, as regular as possible during that time. From regular, I mean more from like a bowel perspective. You don't want to add constipation on top of any of these other things that you're dealing with. Um, and so I, I say kind of when in doubt, no matter what portion of your life, there is a decent amount of evidence around a plant-based diet. I am not fully plant-based myself. I just acknowledge the power of it. And so when you're kind of in doubt, it's a it's an easy base to come back to. And it leads you to more whole foods, more fiber, more produce, more fruits and vegetables. That's what it kind of leads you to. So I think that that's why it's important. To add to that a little bit, um, especially in that age group, like the high schoolers under 18, it's important for them to get their periods. If they start missing their periods more often than they usually do, that's a huge sign of underfueling and potentially could lead to something like red S. So I think it's important to talk to these kids about their periods and explain to them like that it's important. And like, yes, it may be irregular because they're younger, but if you were getting it regularly and it all of a sudden stops, that's something that we need to work on. We need to make sure that we're getting enough food throughout the day. Um, Because it is like something like when I was younger, I know it was like a badge of honor to like not have your period. And that's so wrong. And it's so wrong. Like those kids are learning that. So it's important to talk to them about that. Um, Your period is a huge sign of, of being fueled properly. So that is a huge, important thing for kids. Can I, from a psychology per- perspective on that, um, you know, during the, the menstrual period and, you know, that month, there are symptoms of depression, anxiety, uh, low self-esteem comes into play. So any type of movement for young women increases um, self-esteem, confidence, it boosts those things. It also helps to keep um, keep up with energy levels and so I think from a mental health perspective thinking about during that time uh, there's a time for rest and also a time for movement with young girls and I think the more that they're moving and engaging with others especially with a team or even individually will help reduce those symptoms of low mood or depression definitely decrease symptoms of anxiety too so I think that's important. One more practical random tidbit. I know that um, like menstrual blood leakage during a run is something that can be distressing, particularly in that age group, but really at any point in time, none of us want that to really be happening. Um, And it can be hard, depending on if you're going to be on a long run, what day of your cycle you're at and what your flow is like, you can kind of not know those things. And you might be afraid to ask about it. Um, So something that is a little bit newer, the menstrual cups and discs are good options. When they're in place and fitting properly, you should really kind of not notice them. Um, And they can hold more menstrual blood than a tampon can. And pads, are obviously for some practical reasons probably not everyone's favorite if they're going to be doing a high level of movement Um, so I think that if that's something that someone is open to then that can be a good option but again as with many things we've talked about you don't want to be trying it for the first time on a competition or a race day or something like that Um, but if it's something you're open to and if you are under 18 and have someone who you feel comfortable talking with about kind of the mechanics behind it I would love for everyone under 18 to have someone who they feel comfortable talking to about that. That's probably step one, that everyone can have someone who they feel comfortable talking to about their body and their cycle. Um, but that that can be a, a practical option that from from our perspective as women's health professionals, we don't see any issue with you running with a menstrual cup in. In fact, it can be helpful. Can I circle back to something really quick? Because you made me think about something in terms of leaking. Uh, postpartum for women, one of the things I suggest to patients or clients in particular is if you've just had a baby, your top is very heavy. Mm-hmm. And so I always suggest doubling up on that sports bra. If you're going to be out for a long period of time, so 60 to 90 minutes, uh, there will be leakage Um, and so they make these really great pads that you can put into your sports bra that help to minimize that otherwise when you're finished with the run and you'll (laughs) be walking to the grocery store after and you'll be like oh that happened and where's the baby I need a baby so (laughs) uh, so that's always something I recommend and you know as a as a as a mom that's ran after having two children that's something that I've utilized too so 
random thought, but also if in terms of <laughs> leakage from your bladder, the only other baseline thing, and this may make sense, is emptying your bladder before a long run can help that ha leakage happen less in probably the same way. What else is leaking? We've yes. talked about three different We've things. We've talked about all the, everything can, you, there, can, there can be, sorry, and this is, a, this is a topic that I feel like even to this day, adults, and I talk about it literally all day long, but leakage of stool is something that happens. It can happen in the postpartum period. We should not be afraid to talk about it. We should talk about it. If you're experiencing that in the postpartum period, though, that's a time to be talking to a pelvic health specialist um, to be talking about that. It is not forever, but there's a lot that can be done about it, and it should not kind of happen in silence. Um, so reaching out to someone who talks about it every day, who would love to talk about it with you, is probably <laughs> step number one. Um, but that's somewhere else that leaks. <laughs> <laughs>